When developers begin to use the Spring framework, they can often easily understand dependency injection. But what they struggle with is understanding why we need to use the Spring IOC container. Now that they understand manual dependency injection, we can create an instance of a dependency and pass that into the constructor of a dependent class. And as long as we're using an interface as the type of that dependency, we gain all the benefits of flexibility that dependency injection offers. So this really raises the question, why do we need the dependency injection container? Why do I have to create all this XML configuration and then pass that into the container and have it create the instances of my objects? I can simply create the instances of my objects by instantiating them and passing them into the constructor. Why can't I just use vanilla Java code to wire up all my dependencies? At first, the IOC container may seem like over-engineering, but that's not the case. To demonstrate the benefits of Spring's IOC container, I'm going to show you a few examples. And in these examples, we're going to look at three approaches to wiring our dependencies. And those approaches will be using a static factory pattern, the Spring IOC container, and also manual dependency injection. So to set up our examples, I created clients that each use our rental service. And as you can see, the rental service has a dependency on a source locator. And our clients each have a dependency on the rental service. So I created a client for each approach. For example, we have an admin console that uses manual dependency injection. We also have an admin console that uses inversion of control using Spring's IOC container. And then we also have an admin console that uses a static factory pattern. And there are several different clients. We have an admin console, a customer website, a mobile app, and a nightly inventory job. So all of these clients and applications use our rental service. So let's introduce some changes and we'll see how each of these approaches handles the change. Let's imagine that a member of the security team approaches us and lets us know that all source locator implementations must provide an authentication key to the server. So within our application, we have the kiosk locator, which is an implementation of the source locator that is used by pretty much all of our rental services at the moment. So we need to introduce this new key, and we're going to do that via the constructor. So I'm going to create a constructor, and we're going to provide the key as an argument to the constructor. And we'll make that argument's type a string. Now watch what happens as I save this change in our application. Notice how our package explorer just lit up like a Christmas tree. If you look at the manual dependency injection package, which is right here, you notice that every class within that package aired out. So let's navigate into one of those classes and see what the issue was. It's pretty easy to see that we invoked the kiosk locator constructor and it does not provide the required string argument. So we can simply add a string as the first argument and that should cause our class to now compile. We could apply the same fix to each one of the classes in our manual dependency injection package. We're not going to, we'd simply need to provide that string literal to the constructor. But do you see a problem with this approach? We would need to make that change in each one of those classes. Now, when we have four clients, that's not a big issue. But in an enterprise Java application, where we may have thousands of clients, that's a very big issue. So let's see what went wrong with our kiosk locator factory. Well, you can see we pretty much have the same issue. We need to provide that string as an argument. So we'll pass a string literal and satisfy that argument of the constructor. And that will resolve the issue for each one of our clients that depends on the kiosk locator factory. And now we'll take a look at our IOC approach. Each one of the clients seems to be okay, but you will notice that in our application context.xml file, there is an issue. So while we don't receive a compile time error, 
STS does alert us to an issue in our configuration. Let's see what that says. And it tells us that no constructor with zero arguments defined in class kiosk locator. So that's just saying you haven't provided this argument that's required for the constructor of the kiosk locator. So we can change that. We need to expand our bean tag and now provide the required constructor argument. And I'm just going to pass the value and we'll pass the string literal key. So that satisfies the constructor argument for our kiosk locator class. And if we return, we can see that the error disappears from our XML configuration file. So when we introduce a change into one of our dependencies, we see that the static factory pattern and the spring IOC container seem to handle that change a lot better. And the reason they can do that is because they centralize the construction of the objects used in our application. We were able to fix the issues that arose by introducing the new constructor argument at a single spot. When we use manual dependency injection, the construction of our objects was decentralized. So each class that was dependent upon our rental service required a modification. The Spring IOC container and the static factory pattern definitely proved to be much easier to maintain. And they also proved to be much more flexible than simply using manual dependency injection and specifying our dependencies within the client.